with us. So good morning, everyone. Uh, today I'm very, very, very happy to have uh, here as our special guest, uh, Walter Cohen. Uh, he's a specialist, uh, well, uh, he worked uh, on uh, different topics in philosophy, childhood, uh, uh, education, pedagogy, uh, and now is going to present to us uh, a, an overview on uh, Paulo Freire, whose birthday was a few days ago. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. 100 years a century. exactly the centenary of uh, Paolo Freire so we are uh, delivering this presentation today in uh, a very special moment and I'm very happy that uh, we're going to spend some time knowing this uh, uh, essential uh, uh, philosophical social uh, political uh, character so thank you so much for educating us about him thank you for being here Thank you, Susie, and thank you all of us who are there. And I hope this turns to be a meaningful conversation. Um, Paulo Freire is, is today in Brazil a symbol, like a, a myth in a sense, but also a, an image of political resistance. It's, a, it's very interesting. I'm going to talk and, and if you feel like you want to stop or make a question or comment or whatever, just feel free at any moment. I would like to talk to you so that you can make questions, comments. So feel free to do that at any moment, at any time. So it's, this also has to do with Freire's pedagogy so that the content and the form should not be in contradiction. So, for example, if I say that for Freire, dialogue was very important, I couldn't do a monologue as an intervention. It would be very anti-Freire. Or if I say that for him, the most important thing in a pedagogy is to question. And thank you, Jada, for opening. Nice to see you. Good morning. So that if, uh, if Freire speaks a lot and emphasizes the role of questions and, and criticize what he calls a pedagogy of the answer. Hi, Niemi, good to see you, thank you. So it could be like a contradiction just to answer or just not to foster questions. And so feel free, please. So you would be helping me if you intervene with questions or comments. Or... So, so I, would, I will just give like a framework or a context for Freire. Freire, as Susie told us, was born 100 years ago. So 19 September, uh, 1921. And uh, he, he left us in 1997. So already like 24 years ago. And uh, Freire was born in the Northeast of Brazil, which is a, in a sense a poor region or a, a low considered region of Brazil. And he began to work soon with the literacy of uh, adults and, and youth. So people who have been robbed their school, as Freire says, who have not had the possibility to go to school and were illiterate people. In Brazil in 1963, when, when Freire began to work these uh, literacy plans, there were 40 million illiterate people, 40 million. Still today, there are more than 10 million illiterate people in Brazil. So, and, and at that time, the illiterate didn't vote. So in order to vote, you have to be literate. It was like a condition. And Freire began a lovely experience and so successful that he, I don't know, in, in English, I could say alphabetize or lit, liter, give liter, gave literacy to, 300 people in 40 hours. 
So, and so people began to, to become interested. And so he was called and he organized a national plan, a national lit literacy plan in 63. And uh, this would literate or alphabetize 6 million people in one year. So that was promising. And, and, and the promise was that in some few years, Brazil would overcome the lack of literacy. But in 1964, when the plan has, was only three months born, we have a coup, a dictatorship, and Paulo Freire was, the plan was canceled and Paulo Freire was put into prison. So this is a very, very important thing. I, mean, I, I don't know if, if, if you know, if, if there's another case in the history of humanity that someone is put in prison for being an educator, for, for directing a national plan of literacy. So this is something very strong. And, uh, and still now, Brazil pays for this. And now, just to give you a, a political context, the Brazilian government, which is also in a sense, an authoritarian government, even though it has been elected, but it ha has been elected through a very controversial problems of fake news and with proscriptions of some candidates. So this actual government has as an educational plan, the main element of the educational plan is to export the ideology of Paulo Freire from Brazilian schools. So it's very, it's very sad and it's very, it's very threatening. How? Paulo. Sorry, Walter, in, in what way? What are they doing? Well, I mean, it's, it's a kind of symbolic, so they are, yeah. So, so Paulo Freire was was named here. It's like an honorary honorary title as the patron of the Brazilian education. And so this government has tried in the Congress to to take out this this uh, title. And each time the president or the Ministry of Education have time, they speak bad about Paulo Freire and how all problems of Brazilian education has to do with Paulo Freire with, with being Paulo Freire, a Brazilian educator, and uh, yeah, and but this is is interesting because because of this probably in last Sunday has been commemorating or celebrating Paulo Freire's century has been like a motive for resistance and for political demonstrations everywhere in Brazil, so the government has made something that is going against itself because it's like given it's so absurd it's so ridiculous that uh, Paulo Freire has received more than 40 doctor doctorates honoris causa elsewhere in many universities of the United States in Europe everywhere so and, and on Sunday the news said Paulo Freire is celebrated everywhere but not by the Ministry of Education of Brazil, which is, which is funny. And, uh, and there was even a judge, which a uh, last uh, echo. Nessuno profeta è. Nobody is a prophet in his land. And, uh, but, but also this is also, is also a minority here. So in all, I mean, in, in, among educators, Freire is, uh, is a, it's a very positive. Uh, so in spite of the government, uh, most of popular education, uh, educators love Paulo Freire and Paulo Freire is very present everywhere. So it's just this uh, government, which is very conservative, very against life, against love, against all the things that were important for Paulo Freire. So, unfortunately, there was a judge, a woman, a woman, who last Friday 
uh, intervene and, and make it like a public declaration that if the president, that, that the president was forbidden to make any declaration against Paulo Freire in his birthday. So imagine, this is so, it's unbelievable, yeah. To the point we have arrived. But again, so this is why, why I mention all these, also to understand that Paulo Freire is a very political figure and that he's, he understood education as political. So for him, there's no possibility to be an educator and, and not to take part in, in politics, to be a, a politician. So if you, if you don't take part, Paulo Freire said, if you, if you think that education is something neutral and not political, you would be indirectly reproducing the political order. So legitimating the order of facts. So if you don't help people to question the world, you are like, a, like responsible for the way the world is and continues to be. So he was very committed to, to the political dimension of the educator. And this is also why he inspires so such reactions because conservatives, people who want the world to stay the way it is, of course, feel like a threat of a pedagogy like Freire's. And this is especially important in countries like Brazil, which are very unfair, very unequal. So any, any critical pedagogy or any transformative pedagogy is attacked by, by some some sectors, some parts. So I have tried in, in recent years, I have written a couple of books on Freire. One is very interesting because when we translate it into English, and you know, Susi, it's being translated into Italian. It's going to be published by Mimesis from Milano in no, in November, next, next November. You know, when we translated the, the book to English, it was very funny because the book has a title, Paulo Freire, Mais do que Nunca, in Portuguese. Mais do que Nunca, which in English could be said two ways. Paulo Freire more than never, or Paulo Freire more than ever. That's very interesting. So, because they seem to be contradictory expressions, contradictory time. More than never is any time. One second is more than never. One hour is more than never. One month is more than never. One year, any time is more than never because never is no time. But which time is more than ever? Because ever is all time. So which time is more than all time? If all time is ever, then there's no time besides all time, because if not, it wouldn't be ever or all time. But this makes me think a lot, and this is very important because I think this is the time of Paulo Freire, a time that seems impossible, but is the time of utopia, the time of dreaming, the time of another possible worlds. So that more than never is the usual time, the ordinary time, the time of the educational institutions. But more than never is the real, more than ever is the real educational time in the sense that education has to do with the impossible more than with, with the possible. Because education, the impossible, what is the impossible? The impossible usually is considered as the negation of the possible. So the impossible would be what is not possible. But for Freire, the impossible is the collection of possibilities, like the sum of utopias. So a world in which all possible worlds could enter which seems impossible, but precisely 
it is because of that that it it's the time of education because education has to do with dreaming in dreaming in all possible worlds not just in one possibility so paulo freire has to do with time has to do with childhood with love with equality with errantry with life so i have already talked like 20 minutes um, i feel like you might want to say something or make a question or even with your voice or, or with writing in the chat or any way you could you might want. Let me ask you a question and of course uh, all of you are uh, free to jump in whenever you want we love questions uh, how did he practically do i mean how did he manage to uh educate uh, to to give basic uh, uh, literate education uh, to so many people in such a small time i mean i read about uh, his dialogic engaging uh, participative uh, approach to teaching uh, even more so i mean uh, this requires time so how was his process practically possible well, these 40, these 40 hours mm -hmm. that they, 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 they were, so they were with workers, with people with the um, land workers, agriculturists. And yeah. So they were like, they, it took like one, one month and a half. Yeah. Because it was just one hour every day because they, they work during the day. Right. So they made one hour. And so Paulo Freire, the, let's say methodology, has like two dimensions or... So one is what he calls the cultural circles. So that a, a group of students, Paulo Freire was like a, the leader of a group of students who were working in these uh, courses for 300 people. So a group of students went first to this small village which was called Anjikos, very poor village that has had at that time 75% of illiterate people. Not sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I can show you, I will show you. It's in Portuguese, but I will show you a three minute video mm -hmm. of this experience. Mm. Yeah. Uh, it's very, it's lovely. So don't worry if you don't understand anything about what it said. Just look at the images and uh, because they were, uh, I'm, as I'm speaking and looking here to find this, I found already the video. So as far as before the, this, this uh, formation began, the students went to the village and visit the houses of the people and collected words that were meaningful for them, that belonged to their, to their world, to their reality. Mm -hmm. For example, a break, break? How do you say this, that you build houses? Uh, bricks. Bricks, for example, bricks, for example, work. Mm. So he took these kinds, he cho he, he, they choose like uh, between 10 or 15 of these words. So they, they work on all the phonemas of the Portuguese language through these words. And then in what they call the cultural circles, they discuss the reality of these words. So what these words meant, what involved uh, the relation. For example, if, 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 the, if the word was break, they discuss who made the, 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 the houses for whom, mm. how was this work considered, all, all these kind of cons conscience or, or critical conscious of what you are doing that when you just work, you, you don't have time to do yeah. this. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to show you a very, a very short video, this short videos, three minutes, which is in Portuguese, but again, don't worry don't, on, because the images are very strong. Are you, are you seeing? Yes. Oh, or let me let me just check that I think I don't 
I don't share the audio. Yeah, I didn't share the audio, so I'm going to put the audio now. Okay. So. Agricultura, eu trabalhava o dia, quando chegava em casa de 5 horas, 5 e meia, tomava banho, jantava e ia para a escolinha, né? Com os cabelos escondidos dentro da camisa, não sabe? Porque quando Paulo Freire chegou aqui. Isso foi em 1963, 300 adultos. So now they are just like 10 alive and they are very old because this was like 57 years ago. This was the first experience of literacy. Era uma revolução grande que ele era comunista, não sabe? Angicos não foi escolhida por acaso. Angicos foi escolhida porque naquele contexto era o lugar em que havia o maior índice de analfabetismo do estado do Rio Grande do Sul. Começou assim. É, apareceu um, um ripa aí na, na rua, na cidade, né? anunciando essas escolas, essa escola que ia ter. Aí, mamãe disse, você não vai não, se for quando seu pai chegar, eu faço ele dar uma surra. Eu digo, eu me importo aí, me ajuntei mais minha irmã, eu digo, vamos embora. This is very interesting what you said, because uh, she, she says that a, a jeep came announcing the course, so going through the city and saying, we are going to literate people, come here if you are illiteracy, please come, 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 inviting everyone. And she said, I, I, I told my mother and my mother said, you are not going. If you go, I tell your father and he's going to beat you. It, because this is a very, a very traditional, very... And she said, I, I, didn't, I didn't follow. I, I, I just talked to my brother and we went. And, and it's very interesting that, that she says, we went to, the, to school. But this was not school. It was not in schools. And... And was not, I mean, there were like 16 places in the city where this took place, where houses, in the church, in, in any place that were offered for this. But it, it, it's interesting that, that she says it was a school. And you know that the word school comes from a Greek word, schole. And schole means free time. So school has to do with time. And, and so these people, Paulo, Paulo Freire was seen as a school. So it was like given another time, given. Ricardo is laughing, why tell us, Ricardo? Tell us what, what's happening. Because if it means free time, but it's not free, really. Sorry, sorry? School isn't really free over here. So it's just funny that it translates to free time. Yeah. Yeah, because it's, it's funny. And as you say, they are probably the, the less free spaces now. Schools as institutions. Because all time is very, the only, the only thing that remains free time are the breaks, which are, are the, only, the only time that students love. Because it's the only free time. It's only the time where school is a school. But it was not like this when they were created. They were created to separate the productive time of society from an unproductive time. So school was a place to say, here you can lose time because you are not going to produce anything. You're going to study, to read, to question. So you are going to do unproductive things. Of course, now we live in such a productive system that schools have been co-opted and all we do in school need to be Productive, yeah, exactly. But it was not like that. And I, it's interesting that Dona Francisca still considers that uh, space as, as a school, as, as free time. Because when you work all day and at night you, you have one time to think about what you are doing, it's like free time. It's like, like school, like uh, unproductive because They were not evaluated. They were not in a system that asked for production for, you see? So it was, it was really school, a very free time. But I agree, Ricardo, that now it's, yeah, it's quite the opposite.
it sounds more fun if it's like thought that way where it's like school is more of a time to liberate ideas and uh you know and i really do like the fact that it's like more education mm -hmm. uh, based yeah. on like we're supposed to waste time being educated in a sense exactly exactly because it's giving time to what you think is important and not to what you are told that you need to give because you need to give account of what you did in such a time. So yeah, imagine questioning, for example, questioning is very unproductive because it, it makes you stop instead of going more quickly. So yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's enough. If we can see more, but I think it's, uh, it's interesting that then when when Donna Francisca say, says one, then then she says, and there was a time where uh, the man, he says, the man was prison, then he had to go to exile and school stopped. So if, like if Paulo Freire was seen as a school or at least as as the opening of a school, the, the open, the creating of, creation of the conditions. I see that Yaki has made a question here in the chat. She says, when you talked about how Freire was imprisoned for educating the public, it reminds me of the cultural revolution where being educated was a crime. Yeah. Yeah, that's a meaningful connection. And um, yeah, because education, yeah, education might be seen as dangerous to some political order. There's a funny story about Freddy when he was in prison. Very funny that he talks. He was in prison and the man who was taking care of him, I don't know how you call the, the, the guard, the, the guardian. The guardian asked him to literate because he was an illiterate, the guardian. Ask Freddy to, and, and Freire very funny, he, he answers, but you are mad. Imagine, I am here for being, for, for, for leading a literacy campaign. Imagine if they, if they notice that I am literate in you, they are going to kill me. <laughs> it's, it's very, it's very, I mean, it's, it's funny, but it's tragic. I mean, it's very, it's, it's very strong. And then uh, Ricardo says, uh, Ricardo asked what kind, what level of literacy did a person need to, re, to, in order to vote? Was there a percentage? It is, no, I think that it was something about uh, writing your name. It was something like very simple thing. So, because the vote was also on a sheet of paper. So you have to be able to, to read and, 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 and write. It's, it was not like testing, but you, you, you need to, to read the, the sheet of voting, something like that. And uh, Yaki, his idea of the impossible being the sum of all that is possible seems similar to Parmenides' ideas of ownness. Wow, that's interesting. Because uh, Parmenides' idea has to do with being, has to do with the uh, with the circularity also of being, which is interesting because it's also the time of eternity. So Parmenides oneness is also eternal, is circular, is perfect. So it's, it seems like a world, yeah, like, like a world where all words are in. And it's a time that is not chronological. You know, the Greeks have two, three words for time. They have chronos, which is time as a line, as age. But then they have Ion and, and Kairos, which are more close to the time of a circle and for example, to Parmenides time. Because it's a time that does not pass. It's, it's, it's like an eternal present. It's not the line that goes from past to future as in Kronos, but it's the circle that never ends because you can begin a circle at, this is Heraclitus, which, which, who says that in a circle, the beginning and the end are common. So you can begin a circle at any point 
that at that point you are going to finish. But this is like a that this is why the circle is perfect. And then Kat says, Freire's work really highlights the importance of school, accessible education, how knowledge empowers individuals. It's vital to the advancement of humanity. Thank you, Kat. And I cannot agree more with you. So, so what happens? Or why is it that some people are against school or against accessible education? We have, for example, now this, this government we have in Brazil is such so ridiculous. The, the, the Ministry of Education last week says that university is not for all, it's for, for few. So, and he says this in one of the countries that has the lowest average of young people at the university, which is very elitist. So this is also why Freire is considered an enemy or dangerous, because it's, okay. it's, it's about all. Mm -hmm. How did FAIR get people to be enthusiastic and finish the program? Sorry? Oh, so how did Paula FAIR get people to be like enthusiastic about learning how to read and like stay and finish the whole program? Well, I, I'm not sure how he did, but it seemed, it seemed that it was not a problem. I mean that, I mean, it seems that when you, I, I think I have talked, I have interviewed many of these students and there was just one child because all of them now are like 80 or, or 70 something or, or 80 something. But there's one, there was one child who is 50 something now that entered in the second day of the course because her parents were at the course. So the door was open on the second day she entered and she was allowed because mainly it was not for children, it was for adults. But, and, it, and what it seems is that when you, when you don't have school, when you just have to work and you find a place where you can have time, not to work for another person, but to think about yourself, your world, I think this is, everyone would love this. So I don't think Freire had to, to do too much when opening this space where you can do something extraordinary. Because these people have a very hard work, very alienating work. So they receive very bad salaries, they work hard, like from five in the morning till like 10 or 12 hours a day, and they receive very, very, very low salaries. So when someone opens a space and this, well, here we are going to lose time. You are going to know to read. You are going to think about your world. I think this is something like very, very, very attractive. Very, so, and people might be very tired because they had to work and have to go at night. But it seems that I think 95 or 97 percent of the students arrived till the end and, and successfully. I mean, so. And Java says, I feel like since there wasn't a chance to learn or there was no opportunity, then it was something to be sought after. And like now where education is openly given and encouraged, is that correct? I think it is, yeah, I think, I mean, <laughs> correct is very strong, but I think it's meaningful and that Maybe also because you are thinking in a context like the United States where everyone who wants can be educated. And, and so it's, it's, it's like a right. But here in Brazil, it, it was not. And for many people, it, it still is not. So it's in the law, it's in the constitution. But many people, many children have to work, have to go to work. So I think it makes sense that when when you don't have a chance, because at the time you, you can go to school, you need to go to work. Then when there's something that calls you, 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 you go running because you, you say, wow, finally I have the chance. So maybe you give more value to things that if you have them so easily, then you don't realize they are so important. So, so 
Susi has been for a long time a privilege more than a right. Yeah. Well, in Brazil, it's still a, a privilege. It's a race privilege. It's a class privilege. It's a youth privilege. Because in Brazil, if you are black, if you are women, and if you are low class, the chances you go to school are much lower. So it's a very social and politi political issue. Yeah, in Brazil. Sorry? Sorry. Oh. No, it seems like there is a two reasons why people seek education, at least uh, given different circumstances. Because uh, on one hand, you have people who see education as a practical means to raise themselves out of poverty or out of uh, to in increase their uh, social economic status. And then the other way is what you describe as the Greek way of uh, free time, where it's less extrinsic to uh, it's more and more intrinsic to the process of education itself. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I think for a, a lot of developing nations, such as China and Brazil, uh, education for a long time has been seen as a way of the um, first way where it's less all about the intrinsic nature of education and more about the extrinsic nature of education and how that can increase or benefit you in some social economic sense. Yeah, yeah, I think that makes sense. Uh, these students, for example, these these first students of that course, they were, then they were asked, why were they interested in being literate? And the reasons were very diverse. So some said because they, they would be able to vote. Some said because they would be able to read the Bible. Some said because they would be able to write letters and read letters. Because at that time, there were the profession of writer of, of letters. So if you went to a train station, there would be a desk and someone who would write letters for illiterate people. So this, this was, they said it was unable to take in autonomy from this. So they wouldn't need to pay to write or to read letters. Also some said to read the newspaper so I think that they are a combination of reasons, as you said, uh, Jackie, now that some are more productive and some are more unproductive in, in the sense of free time and, and, and being human and, and, and like actualizing a right or, or a dimension of humanity that is neglected when you don't have education. Yeah, because like it's, it, I, I can't really speak for other cultures, but at least from a uh, Asian and Chinese perspective, um, mm -hmm. like we have this reputation that uh, Asian people care a lot about education, uh, which is partially true because uh, we are raised to think that education is a very important thing for its productive reasons. Mm. Um, we're exposed to seek education for its productive reasons, but as soon as we seek education for its unproductive, its free time reasons, then we are uh, reprimanded for it. There's something somehow wrong with seeking education for its intrinsic properties of being human, being introspective, being, and uh, I find that really. Uh, jarring <laughs> for a culture that supposedly values education so much and i'm, I'm just kind of um trying to draw relationships between my experiences and experiences of other cultures that's interesting it's interesting it's strong when you say that in asia the value of education ha has to do with productive reasons that's very strong and very interesting and makes makes me think because they are I, I think that the first separation we can make is between countries who value education and countries who don't value education i think brazil at least 
and South America, Latin America maybe, are clearly countries that do not value education. And then among those who value, you can have those who value because of its productive risk outcomes or because it's unproductivity. And I think in, in Latin America, of course, we have plenty of people who, who value education and, and especially poor people and, and, and lost of thinkers and like Paulo Freire and many others. So there's a whole tradition of Latin America popular school. But I mean the, 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 the political order, the governments, the political policies uh, haven't value education. I would, I would love even that they would have valued for, for productive reasons as you do, but, but I think that, so that's an interesting discussion and distinction. Who else wants to, I think we have like 10 minutes more, right? I, some more than 10 minutes. So I would like to listen more people or more comments or more questions. I don't know, I would like to share with my class uh, how beautifully Paulo Freire never stopped, by the way, because it is true that there was a coup, that it's true that uh, he was arrested, but then uh, he was in exile and he yeah. continued. Yeah. Because in Chile and uh, I mean, in Latin America, yeah. he kept doing this wherever he was, which is amazing. That's amazing, exactly. So, so yeah, first he was in Chile like five years, <clears throat> then in the United States, in Cambridge, he was like for one year, and, and then in Europe, in Switzerland, and then he did uh, many campaigns in, in Africa, in Latin America. So Paulo Freire, there's something he says many times, which is very nice. He says, I am always at the beginning. That's very interesting because it's like, it's like a declaration of love to childhood. So he's always beginning, he's always being born. And he thinks that education has to do with beginning, with, uh, with opening, with, uh, and also with love. For him, the last interview he says, I could be, I could like to be remembered as someone who loved deeply, not only human beings, but every form of forms of life, the earth, the birds, the trees. So it's mainly a loving pedagogy uh, that thinks love as a condition to education and love not just or not only love uh, as, a, as a feeling, but love as a believing in the new worlds or in what we, we are saying about dreaming the impossible and utopias. So, mm -hmm. incidentally, this is a class on the ethics of love. Oh, it, wow. <laughs> yeah, this is a full semester. We are using ancient philosophy to reflect on the ethics of love. So, wow. I decided to talk on uh, Paulo Freire. Freire. <laughs> so, let me just say two or three words about love and Paulo Freire. So, this is how the pedagogy of the oppressed ends, mm -hmm. which is very beautiful. Because after writing the whole pedagogy of the oppressed, which is about the oppressed and oppression, he says, if this book does not uh, have any other success, at least it remains my faith in that human beings will be able to build a world where it will be less difficult to love. Oh. Very beautiful. It is a faith that human beings will be able to build a world where it will be less difficult to love. So not more easy, but less, less difficult. Mm -hmm. Because it's very difficult to love in, in capitalism. Yeah. It's very difficult to really love, unproductive love, not to love and, and, and love in terms of consumerism or in terms of on, on, on the logic of the, of the capital. So, so Paulo Freire was very sensitive to love. 
love was like a condition to an educator. An educator who does not love cannot be an educator. So, and it's not about loving someone. It's about loving the position you are, loving the role of being an educator, loving the possibilities, loving the time you offer to your students. So love was a very, very deep and important concept in Paul Freire. And we need words. I mean, it's true. Love manifests itself through actions. But words help too. I mean, uh, being educated, knowing what you're feeling, being able to give a shape uh, and uh, communicate it to uh, about what you're feeling mm -hmm. <sighs> makes love less difficult. <laughs> Let's put it mm -hmm. this way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and even now, in, in, I think through Zoom and this kind of thing is, is much more difficult. Uh, I think this is also a, a cultural stuff, but uh, Brazilian context, Brazilian education, Brazilian culture is a very touching culture. Mm -hmm. I, am, I am now doing a, a, I am traveling through Northeast, uh, like recreating a Freudian pedagogy of the question. Mm -hmm. I'm visiting schools, uh, camps, uh, yesterday they have been with the, we, in a no land people camp uh, uh, all, uh, it's 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 wonderful every day uh, uh, it's it's uh, it's an extraordinary travel and there are two things that you cannot avoid when you enter school here one is to eat uh, uh. because school has to do with food <laughs> And, and and has to do with love the love the love the, the the people who work in the kitchen we are very poor most of people are very very poor but they do it with such a love that when they offer it's it, because children also went to school to eat it's very important uh, so so school is a place where you eat and, and you you share food and, and it's also about touching about hugging uh, when you go to a school here, the children jump on you. It's uh, it's very it's very I, I love that. It's very it's part of of this culture. Mm -hmm. So so these things about Zoom are very strange here because it's just about you see it's uh, and also that Zoom. I think school needs a separation from house from home for very different reasons. Here, in, even there are students, especially women, poor women who tell us that they cannot speak uh, at home, that they need to go out. So this is a very difficult moment. And, and it's a very interesting question. What are we doing in Zoom? If this is education or is maybe it's another thing. May, it might be also interesting, but maybe it's not a school. At the college level, or uh, even graduate level, uh, I must say that I'm very happy about the democratic access uh, to knowledge uh, that Zoom is giving me, I, I must say, because uh, I was one of those uh, whose PhD was mainly taking uh, your luggage and having to travel uh, to check the manuscripts here, uh, listen to this great guy there, uh, and so on. And now I'm so happy that, uh, yeah, I can have, uh, I can listen from the best expert in Paolo Freio and uh, it's, it's accessible. So, yeah, but also, say, but also there is, a, um, but this has a, it's accessible for some privilege of us, which we are privileged. Yeah, we are privileged. Absolutely. We have lost here in, at my university, we, ha we have lost like 20% of the students. I know, yeah, that's the same problem here. I strongly agree. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's one of the problems also of the cameras off because uh, many of us uh, do not have access to internet or to the classes mm -hmm. in general. Yeah, yeah. So if we, if we had public policies, I yeah. agree that it could be very democratic. Yeah. But unfortunately, at least here in Brazil, inequality is much more, much more strong okay. here than before Zoom. I mean, yeah. The pandemic has been used 
to enlarge the inequality. Yeah, I can it's imagine. Yeah. yeah. There was one question that was left unanswered from Esther. Esther, how many teachers in general did they have for students? Was it large groups or smaller class sizes? I think, well, this, this experience of the 300 were like uh, 20, um, 20 students per class. Um, but this, this was a very special, because these students, this was a far city from the capital. So they li lived at that place. So they, they transferred themselves into the city so that they slept there and they had breakfast and they took about the course and how it was going and they evaluate the day before till 5 or 5 p.m when they met the students for one hour so it, it was a very like uh, experimental experience but i would say now i have traveled all through brazil carrying and watching and, and experiencing lots of popular educations. My personal experience is that it, it does not have to do with the size or that the main things about education are not technical and are not, uh, what I mean is that you can have five students or you can have 50, but there's something you need that does not depend on the quantity of students you have. Something that has to do in my feeling with love, with childhood, with errantry, with equality, and the way you relate to all these things that make that some teachers in very difficult conditions seem like ma magicians, in some others in very privileged conditions cannot touch any anything so i think that the education is more an art that, than a technique and so an artist sometimes with very few material things do wonderful pieces of art and some others with a lot of uh, materials do very poor so my suspicion and i think paulo Freire would agree with this that each Educator is her method that you find to, you have to find that for yourself. And, and it's a piece of art being an educator. I guess the reason why I brought it up is uh, my mother is a public high school teacher and she Your often talks, okay? oh, she's a public high school teacher. Okay. And she often talks about how the classes are getting bigger and, you know, every time it used to be like 30, now it's going yeah. 35 and sometimes it's going to 40 and just, yes. you know, limited resources. Um, so, yes. you know, a lot of parents will say, oh, our, parent, our kids aren't getting as much attention as the yes. class sizes get bigger. Um, but at the same time, there's like some university classes that have like a thousand students, right? <laughs> Where there's like, well, obviously they can't even fit in one room. So it's just kind of a question of, is the numbers, maybe you just have to change up the structure. I think that's very important, very important, interesting, because, for example, if you have a, an educational policy that obliges you to, to do some kind of things and you have to do it with larger number of students, that will make you some trouble. So you have, to, you have some operational difficulties. But there's also a richness, especially when you think education as conversation, as dialogue, and not as, as transmission of knowledge. For example, I... I in my gra graduate classes, I always open them. I mean, I love classes of 50 uh, people from different regions speaking different languages, different tones, different histories, because all that enriches the classes. If you are only five, there's a moment it be can become a little boring because we, we know very well each other. So, so it depends on what you on what you think education is about and the context and the demands. And Nicolas says litigation is one of our national pastimes. <laughs> yeah. 
Okay, so I think we need to finish. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you so you. much for uh, having touched us, for uh, yeah, <laughs> having you. warmed up uh, this Zoom class and uh, shared your experience and your knowledge. Thank you. I'm Thank really you so happy you accepted uh, our invitation. Hope you you keep fine and safe and you too. And like Thank you so much. Bye. Have a bye good bye. day. Bye, everybody. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.